We asked our subscribers what they were most interested in us talking about next, and the most popular item was more on arranging. So here you go. This is about arranging. In this case, it's music in lines. How do you arrange different lines of music to work together? Producers often talk about the musical real estate, the high frequencies, the middles and the lows, and they get into conversations about EQ and compression. Really important conversations, but not the conversation that we're going to have here today. What we're more interested in is the stage before that, where you're making decisions like my vocal line is going to have long notes and my bass line is going to be busy or vice versa. Those kind of things where you're balancing the different lines of music to make them sound good to your ears. We'll be talking to some incredible musicians to talk us through some really important points about arranging. Let's get started. Okay, so just be super clear. I'm just going to define what I mean by lines. I just mean single notes. It could be a vocal line, could be a bass line, a single note guitar or synth line. I'm just not talking about block chords where you play on a synth lots of notes at the same time or maybe strum a chord on a guitar. I'm not talking so much about those things. They're really important, and we'll bring them in a little bit, but the main focus is on how you bring more than one line together to work. And whenever you're doing that, whenever you're bringing more than one line together, you're doing what is traditionally known as counterpoint. Counterpoint to me just means the ways that different instruments and different parts work together as one cohesive unit. Counterpoint to me is building up exciting tension. So uh, it's there in a, it's there in funk music, uh, James Brown in reggae. It's there when kids are singing in canon. Somebody sings a line, some, and you build layers. You know, it's there in our life, different things happening. In composition, we try and find a way of organising. So you have a bass line, and then you have a top line, for instance and how they work together and how they're interweaved. That's counterpoint. It's just going to be there as soon as you've got three or four tracks, which you're going to have when you're writing a pop tune. So turn on the radio, you will hear counterpoint pretty quickly, whatever channel you're on. It's everywhere, as you'll discover in a minute. Um, I was looking at the Wikipedia page of counterpoint the other day, and it's interesting. It's it's seems to be written in a sort of code for a certain sort of music. It almost presumes that it's something that only happens in classical music um, and barely mentions other forms of music at all. And there's a lot of us musicians who really disagree with this point of view. In learning how to arrange, learning how to compose, when we think of counterpoint, we think of very classical standards, classical precedents, but it is really shown in every aspect of music, every genre of music. Um, and it's not as, nearly as scary as I think people make it out to be. It really is just how all of these different parts work together as one. All these different rhythms and all these different harmonic parts work together to make one song. That is all counterpoint. It really is at the end of the day. So let's go step by step, starting from some simple kinds of counterpoint, building up towards the end of the video to some more complex ones. The first place to start is two-part counterpoint. So this is the easiest way of arranging lines. You've probably done it yourself already. We'll look at some examples from different genres. I'm going to start with one of the most common things that you can do is you have one thing that just goes round and round, and the other one is varying over the top. The example that I picked is extremely famous track, um, and hopefully you can see the two different lines here. The red one here is the vocal, and you can see that the vocal is kind of quite detailed and does lots of different things. And the green here is the bass line, and you see it's just a pattern that goes round. And as soon as I play, I'm sure you will recognise it. Bass line just repeating the same thing. So what do we notice about this track? There's a lot of things to talk about, but the thing that I want to talk about first is that both of these lines agree with the chords. 
one way you could have arranged this song is Jack White could have just sort of thrashed through the chords. He could have gone... and arranged it like that. That is one sort of arrangement. Um, because both the lines go with those chords. Dum, da, 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 dum, dum. And his vocal line also fits with those chords. Um, it's pretty much a rule of counterpoint that no matter how fancy your lines get, they're all going to fit underneath a chord sequence. So thinking in lines doesn't necessarily mean that you're not thinking about chords as well. The two kind of go hand in hand. I definitely sit down at the piano for an extended period of time to try to figure out voicing, not even voicing, but chords that can work and then how I can eventually work the, however many parts I'm working to into, a nice, into nice voicings. Each of your two lines will probably have really different distinctive rhythms to each other. This is Amy Winehouse. Here we go. Same idea. You can see a bass line that just repeats exactly the same twice and a vocal line which is doing something a bit more detailed and a bit less repetitive. All I can ever be to you is the darkness that we know and this regret I got of custom to Once it was the ride when we were at our high waiting for you in the hotel at night. Okay, the thing that I want to point out here is how different the rhythms are and how they're different at different times. This is a classic thing of counterpoint and of w making lines work. See how the bass line here is playing long notes, whilst the vocal is at the same time playing a rhythmically fast passage. When the bass line does do a busy bit here with these shorter notes, the vocal isn't doing anything. It just leaves a space in both of those places. So not everything needs to be complex all the time. Listen to that again. All I can ever be to you is the darkness that we know and this regret I got a custom to. Bum, bum, ba -dum. Once the ride when we were at our house. So they're filling in gaps for each other. And another really important thing is that that bass line, like the White Stripes bass line, is not just playing couple of notes ba -ba, or some long notes at the beginning of each bar just playing the root note so if it, the chord is C playing a C um, it is playing a hummable melody with its own rhythm and its own shape I sketch something I'll go back and look at that bass line where it's just maybe playing a minim and then another minim just holding down the bass I Think of other ways for me to make that bass line tell a story. So basically delineate the line, because I think the line is so important in the bass. So can you see that we're talking about music that um, always has at least two tunes going? If you listen to this sort of song, like a classic sort of piano. There's only one tune to listen to, it was my vocal. There was nothing to listen to on the piano in terms of hummable tunes. And it'd be the same if I strummed a, a guitar and su sung that kind of song. Um, whereas in all the music we're going to be listening to, there's always at least one other tune that you could hum. OK, let's go to the next example. The vocal line in red, this guitar line in green. Let's talk about the shape of the melody. Look how the guitar line is a wave shape, whereas the vocal line has a sort of static and then a little whiddly bit, static and then a little whiddly bit, static and then a little whiddly bit, a different ending. But very contrasting shapes. So you might want to have in your different lines a different rhythm and a different shape. OK, a bit of Missy Elliott. You'll notice here they've got somewhat similar vibes, but the vocal always starts on the offbeat. The main tune always starts on the onbeat. They're varying their rhythm. Missy be putting it down. I'm the hottest round. I told your mother, y'all can't stop me now. Listen to me now. I'm lasting 20 rounds. And if you want me, then come on, get me now. They also did that classic thing of 
introducing one idea first, playing it a few times, so you get used to it, and then you're ready for something new. You don't need to introduce all your lines at the same time. Next example, something from Cuba. Introduce the first idea first, then we'll be ready for the next idea. Again, just repeating, repeating this first idea two times round. But there's also one other thing going on in this, in this tune that I want to draw your attention to. And it's about block chords. Got your two main lines, vocal line, guitar line, and there's a guitar just sort of strumming and playing the odd chord. Okay, that's quite a common thing. So um, I said I wasn't going to talk about block chords, and I don't want to. I just want to tell you that they're there and that it's a really, really common thing to do. Um, in fact, it's used in all genres, this idea of just having one sort of instrument just laying out the chords in the background, even if it's not the most important thing. Listen to this little piece of uh, music. This would have been written ooh, roughly something like 1680 or that sort of time. Um, this has actually got three parts of counterpoint, but the point is clear. And you'll hear that there, whilst there's three lines, there's also a sort of harpsichord just playing, fleshing out the chords, a bit like in the Cuban track. Can you hear it? In classical music, it's called continuo. Get the idea? So that you can have several lines and just something busking out the chords to sort of help bed the track down. So you can double lines, like in the Amy Winehouse bass line, or you can create parallel lines. Here's an incredibly famous example. A lot of these tracks that I'm playing are incredibly famous because well-arranged tracks just do seem to be popular. So in this incredibly famous track, one of the big parts, which is a synth and bass, is moving in parallel harmony here. In other words, all these lines go up at the same time and go down at the same time in the same rhythm. Okay, so I'm going to include my discussion things that are doing that. They're not just busking the chords or any old how. They're absolutely arranged and placed, even if they're playing ha parallel harmony. So I'm going to talk about them as being like one part, even though there's three lines. So what they could have done, one way they could have arranged it, they could have gone. Which is more like busked, but they haven't. They've arranged it and they've done this. They've put that rhythmic definition, which is different to the vocal line, and doing all the things that we've already discussed to make this, these three lines become a sort of single part. And of course, another example that you won't find on the Wikipedia page about counterpoint is where one of the lines is spoken. And I'm going to include that in my discussion about counterpoint because they, um, a line, for example, a hip-hop vocal, has got so much rhythm. Um, and it might still inflect up and down, so it still has shape, um, even if it's not doing pitch notes. So this is a, another really, really famous example over this bass line. You'll hear loads of definition to the vocal. So we're definitely going to be including non-pitched um, elements, speaking, maybe even percussion in some of our discussions later on. But now let's move on. You can see you can do a lot with two parts. What can you do with more than two parts? So as we move forward, adding more and more lines, you might find that they start to become 
harder to hear. Use the visualizations that, that I've given you to maybe help hear them. If you don't hear it the first time, maybe you'll have to listen to it, to it again. You know, it's, it's totally normal. Let's listen to an example from an Ethiopian artist, Yesen Getahun. <laughs> It's got all the hallmarks of um, the tracks that we were listening to before. Each part has got its own shape, you know, staying on one place, regular pattern, wave shape, really, really different to each other. They're starting on different parts of the bar. This one is um, anticipating the beat. These two are starting on the beat, but this one's filling in the gap left by that one. So they're all doing the things that we've discussed. I don't know about you, but you might start to find this thing happening, which happens with pieces in Counterpoint, where you're not quite sure what you're listening to some, sometimes, in a good way. You're not quite sure. Am I listening to one part? Am I flipping between listening to the bass line? Doom, 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 boom. Doom, doom, doom. To listening to the vocal or the backing vocal? Or are you listening to the whole? I don't think you need to resolve that problem. I think that is just the thing about listening to music with counterpoint. You sort of move within it. It's one reason why it's so popular and why so many forms use it is that it's something that means you can listen to the same track over and over again, listening to it in a new way. It's the same thing with mixing engineers as well, you know, where you give them however many dozens, hundreds of tracks and they are in charge of knowing what to bring out and when. Half the time you don't hear in the, in the final track when you listen to it, but at the same time, when you take it away, it's very clear, it's very clear that something is missing. And so, uh, yeah, this, it's the same thing with the mixing of knowing when, when things are important. And that very much applies to writing, applies to performance, applies to everything. Okay, here's another example. I just couldn't resist playing this track. I completely love it. But it's got that effect where one of the lines is being obscured. This yellow line, which sounds like these. That thing. As soon as the bass line comes in, it's kind of hard to hear, but it is still there. And if you took it out, you'd really miss it. But you're not really focusing on it. You start to focus on the bass line. Here we go. There's the bass. Just look at how organized that screen is. You know, someone who doesn't make music but just does graphic design. I mean, maybe that wouldn't be a beautiful design, but it certainly is an organized design. And then that's uh, music is just organized. Okay, another track. This is by Little Sims, Two Worlds Apart. And here we got four part counterpoint. The top line here, you can see it's sort of irregular. But, well, it's got these spaces every time where she has to breathe, so it's got that sort of order. The second line is a guitar line, and it's got this, you know, busy space, busy space, busy, big space, and then it repeats. The bass is just really simple, just doing this boom, boom, long notes to contrast with this busy top line. And that busy top line contrasts a lot with the, the blue line there that you can see, which is a backing vocal that just repeats with these sort of long notes. Da -da -dum, bum. Really spacious, leaving plenty of room for the busier guitar line and the vocal. Okay, let's have a listen and it'll all start to make sense. Lady, 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 lady. No, you see the confidence, believe me, I am wavy. I need something deeper, money does not stimulate me. Whether you got mansions or got diamonds in your AP. Drama, 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 drama. Please don't tell my mama I've been smoking marijuana. Talk peanut colada's getting loose in the Bahamas. Okay, so this track uses uh, one very famous thing that's often used in counterpoint called contrary motion, which is, just means that one line goes up while the other goes down or vice versa. And you'll be able to see a much more subtle version of this happening in the Little Sims track, the guitar part and the backing vocal. 
It's a classic case of where you have two really strong melodies, this guitar. Do, 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 do. That's what you mean by counter melody. It's really strong, but it's going counter to the direction of the other one. It's going down when the other one's going up. Vocal falls while the guitar rises. Here's another example, six part counterpoint this time. This top line, that's the vocal sung in harmony, in two part parallel harmony. And this little synth line is also playing not quite in parallel. Sometimes the, the lines are going in different direction, but more or less parallel bass line and another lead synth. Um, here we go. Very famous track from the 80s, this one. I don't know what you were focusing on there. Maybe they were maybe just focusing on the lead line. I don't know. But in there is a little pad going dung 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 dung. <laughs> There's another one going dun 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 and the bass line going dun dum dun dum dun dum dun dum. So much detail. Don't you want me, baby? Bum 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 bass line bum 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 or the lead line dun 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 so, whew, quite a lot on the air. Quite, I mean, it all sort of works in its in its um, synth pop way, but complicated. Let's listen to some artists um, that aim for clarity. If you want to learn about counterpoint, funk is a brilliant place to start. Now, this isn't from the seventies, that era. It's a bit of slightly more recent funk, although this track is quite old actually. But it's a bit of Beyonce. Um, you can even see when I put that on the screen how much more ordered that is than the, the synth pop track. Just three parts this time. So much order. Look at the shape of this. That is the little, um, there's a little clavinet line. That's the vocal line there. For some reason, I put it in the middle. Um, but And the bass line has complete order. Here we go. Somehow much, much easier to hear everything. And another brilliant place to, to hear counterpoint, which is super clear where you can hear everything, is reggae. Here's an example by, um, I don't know, I suppose the most well-known reggae artist of all time, Bob Marley. Maybe not his most famous track, but I absolutely love this one. This has sort of got it all for me. Um, it's got absolutely everything we've discussed and some things that we haven't discussed. Um, so I'm going to point them out. And I haven't notated the electric piano there, which is busking some chords along. I do want to spend a, a minute just going over why I think this is such a brilliant arrangement. Um, space, definition of lines. Um, the vocal line has got so much space. Look how it's playing completely long notes um, when these two lines are playing short notes. So it's not just the shape, it's actually the articulation. Different notes have different lengths. Um, so these are playing little staccato notes whilst this is long. Um, when the vocal isn't singing, that's when the harmonica comes in. That's the red one there. Um, same thing here, the harmonica fills in the space. Um, the other thing which is intriguing about this is that there's a bass, which is the green, and there's the clavinet, which is the purple. Um, and they start off, they sound like they're gonna be in, in unison or in octaves, but then it plays a little trick on you and the um, the clavinet sound does a little echo. We'd call that a canon, where you just echo exactly what the bass has played. 
Um, and it does it again there. It's a pattern. So it's going together apart, together together, together apart, together together. Let's listen to the bass and the clavinet. <laughs> The space is filled, but it's not overfilled. Incredibly clever arranging. That's off an album called Natty Dread. Every track on that is has got that kind of beauty of arranging and that sort of clarity where there seems to be a lot going on, but there's never too much. Um, I really recommend it. I'm going to return to funk for a minute, and this is a bit of 70s stuff. I want to return to this idea of... Um, of articulation, because there's some subtlety in this in this track, which is by Sly Stone. This is one of his most famous tracks. Again, just looking at it, you can see the shape. Like that's playing a long note when that's busy. The bass is always playing short notes. But the thing that I want to draw your attention to is how they're not all short. It's tending to go long short, long short, long short. So it's not just an articulation doesn't necessarily need to be, I'm always going to play a short note, but, 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 but. That bass line is going, but, but, but. Um, and the vocal is sort of doing something similar over the top. It's this, the green one. So starting with some short notes, but it goes on this journey. If we expand it, you can see the sort of, it's not completely random. If I expand it even more, you can see it's just doing these sort of wave shapes. While the brass, um, the red one, is just does four of these descents with a little twiddly bit. So you've got an element of randomness in the vocal with these slowly undulating lines, the solidity of the descending middle line and this very characteristic bass. Okay. Yeah, yeah. If you want me to stay, I'll be around today to be available for you Ross. to see. Ba, ba, ba. Look how the brass and the bass are nearly always in contrary motion. So this thing of having definitive shapes, that bass, it's such a rooted sort of catchy step that it enables Sly to do all this really kind of... Um, Fancy vocalizing over the top. If you want me to stay, I'll be around today to be available for you to see. I'm about to go and that. then go. you'll know for me to stay. Okay. Every single track we've listened to so far has chords underpinning all the various different lines. I just want to say that it is possible to do music with lines which isn't thinking about chords so much. So even at the dawn of sort of classical counterpoint, this piece by William Byrd, this would have been, yeah, I don't know, in the 16th century, 1500s. He wasn't really thinking about chords like saying, oh, I'm playing a G7 here and then C diminished. He was thinking about whether things were consonant or dissonant, but he wasn't thinking about chords like a sort of like Elton John thinks about chords. In fact, the organizing principle that William Bird was more concerned with here was about repeating echoing. Can you remember I talked about in the Bob Marley track about echoing stuff? You've got um, canons basically, and canons where someone is doing the same motif but singing it higher or lower. So this has got this canon. Da, 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 da. And you start to hear that come in, starting on a different pitch, lower down. Here it comes higher. Ba, ba, ba. And now lower. And the whole piece is built out of this little, you'll hear it all the way through. And the low one. Boom. So yes, it is possible to make things out of canons. You, you probably will have sung London's Burning or those kind of things when you were a kid. 
Um, but it's a way of making music without starting from a point of view of chords, possibly. And it's something that, that contemporary composers use too. I like using counterpoint um, in a way to develop melodies. Um, so I might start with the, the basic melody and then an instrument will come in with a counterpoint po line. I also like to write in rounds. Um, so I'll do that as well as a technique I like, um, but not strictly sticking to that technique. So I might elongate like a minim to, I don't know, something else or um, change the rhythm of something. So it kind of fits anyway. Um, but yeah, I really like using counterpoint. And there's lots of experimental music as well, which um, maybe th has lines of sound, um, which just have all that sort of definition that we're thinking about, where each line is definitely serving a different purpose to another line. It's filling a different part of the sonic space. But it could also be a pop song, you know? A pop song could have, like, this track by NERD. This has really, I mean, it feels like counterpoint, really. It's arranged with so many of the rules that we were talking about earlier on, but I think there's only one thing that is actually hitting a note, and there's this little bing, 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 little noise. I mean, it's not really pitched, is it? But it's organised, it's incredibly organised, like all the music that we've been listening to. Bouncing around. It took me a long time to kind of get out of the classical thinking because I grew up playing classical piano and then in college, you know, we, when we had to take music theory, it was all, almost all based on classical theory. And so for me, I kind of stopped thinking about how parallel fifths are bad or how parallel motion versus contrary motion, how one is preferred over another. Um, and so it's, I think it's a mixture of conscious thinking of I need to have this certain chord progression or this movement happening in these voices. But a lot of the time, it's just what I feel in the moment. I mean, I, I would say that even though I learned about counterpoint um, at school and university, I don't tend to think about it as counterpoint. I'm not, I'm rarely kind of writing and thinking I'm doing counterpoint right now. Um, but are you doing counterpoint? But yes. <laughs> So there you go, music and lines. Lots and lots of examples from around the world, from different eras. In our next video, our third video on arranging, we'll be talking about um, how you can go about actually practically constructing your own uh, music in lines, your own counterpoint.